Thank you, thank you. Good morning. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin, followed by hymn number 384. O Lord, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory is chanted above the heavens by the mouths of babes and infants. You have set up a defense against your foes to still the enemy. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? And mortals that you care for them. Yet you have made them little less than the heavenly beings. Let us sing praise to God above, the God of all creation. Recognizing it. 
Amen. Virtually, Charles is there in person, and the appointments were fixed. So, like it or lump it, we're here for another year. <laughs> and I, I don't have to move. No, that's not fair. Um, no, I, we've been here four years, and we thank God every day that God brought us to the beautiful, loving family of St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Boulder. And we're just so happy to be here for another year. So, year five starts July 1st. And uh, this past week, on Thursday afternoon, our Summer Women's Book Club started to meet. This is the book we're talking about. It's called Find the Good, and I thank God for the Summer Women's Book Club, because we have so much fun on Zoom. We can stay in the comfort of our own homes. Uh, we can take comfort breaks when we need to, but uh, this is a great book. Each chapter is standalone, so if you miss a few sessions, you can always zoom back in for whatever we're doing. So we did the first two chapters, and this coming week we'll do chapters three and four. So we had a great time. Claudia Mills is doing a great job leading us. Praise God. Thank you. Anybody else? I can't see hands. I have a joy and an update from the Richardsons. They just left this morning to go back to Iowa, but they came for the groundbreaking of their home in Louisville. So on top of that, um, we didn't mention that Sid, we, we've been back to Iowa in about a month ago for Sid's uh, graduation from Iowa State University, and she is now a veterinarian. And moves in about uh, 10 days or so uh, to Oregon where she has her first job lined up. Oh, that's good. Very good. Anybody else? Well, as one who knows just a, a bit about it, I want to say that you all are privileged uh, to have uh, Charles and Melinda as your pastoral family. And uh, they're a blessing. So, can you tell him or do we have to? I don't know if we really have to. <laughs> okay, Let us pray. I will. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, we want to be your disciples. The problem is that sometimes we want to lead rather than follow. 
Sometimes we think we know when we don't. Sometimes we think we understand and when we can't. We don't own ourselves. We belong to you. We ask for insight to make us better than we are. Courage to face our faults and a willingness to act. Help us to turn our face toward the world's problems and do what we can to correct them. May we love the unknown among us and the suffering. Hear the prayers raised from this sanctuary today, prayers of blessing and thanksgiving. Bless those who pray and those that we pray for. Mm. We ask all this in the name of Jesus who taught us a very special prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
Thank you, Wendy. That is one of my favorites. And for those of you who don't know, there is a DVD video uh, covering that song sung by Jerome Hines many years ago, which walks us through the paths of Jesus. Yeah. Paul to Romans. So what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That's what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life in a new land. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we are lowered into the water, it's like the burial of Jesus. When we are raised up out of the water, it's like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace, sovereign country. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of Christ was nailed to the cross with, our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ. A decisive end to the sin miserable life. No longer captive to sin's demands. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him, but alive he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way, sin speaks a dead language. That means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue, and you hang on every word. You're dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. That means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. <laughs> Don't even run the errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full time, remember you've been raised from the dead, into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tired anymore. You're living in the freedom of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I was going to wear my robe this morning, but over the years it's grown longer. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it drags on the floor now. We live in a world full of captivating, challenging experiences. Some are wonderful. Some confound us. Many are paradoxical, even seemingly contradictory. In all of them, we can be haunted by our flaws as we seek to understand and appreciate the message this morning is oriented around personal reflection. I hope you will be able to relate it to your own life experiences. Let's begin with a quiz, a brief quiz. If we all pass it, perhaps we can move on to the benediction. 
No, leave just yet. As we respond to the questions, there are only two. Consider yourselves to be ministers. You know, our bulletin says that you are. Question number one. <clears throat> are you going on to perfection? Yes. 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 No. Question number two. Do you expect to be made perfect in this life? No. With God's will. The correct answer to both questions is, of course, yes. <laughs> At least that's what the Methodist discipline says if one wants to be ordained as a minister. My goodness, what was Wesley thinking? <laughs> <laughs> made perfect in love. Carl Burt, a preeminent theologian of the 20th century, if he had a sense of humor right now, he must be laughing. Look at the meditation quote from him at the front of the bulletin. Reinhold Niebuhr, the great American social theologian, like Mark, didn't think mankind had managed to escape sinfulness. There is a March 8, 1948 issue of Time magazine which carries a picture of Niebuhr on its cover, and the caption is a quote from him, man's story is not a success story. Oh dear. The question now, as it has always been, is can we live, can we leave sin behind? Hmm. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, upon self-reflection, wasn't so sure. He, he ended his famous introspective poem with a sort of resigned statement. Whoever I am, I am thine, O Lord. Whoever I am. If we're truthful, isn't that about where most of us are? Hmm. Willing, but short of the mark. So where does that leave us? I suggest somewhere between the crucifix and an empty cross. Hmm. More on that later. At least it ought to leave us a bit more humble about who we are and who God is. There are many wonders we experience in life that can help us answer those questions, but we must be careful. Some of them contain traps. A few months ago, Betts and I pulled up behind a shiny new bright yellow Volkswagen bug at the intersection of McCaslin Boulevard and South Border Road. <clears throat> the car was a convertible, all gussied up to look like the quintessential sports car. Behind the wheel said a with a wizened old man with white hair, sun-dressed skin. As he sped away, folks like in books can do that. We noticed a sign on the back of the car. Student driver, please be patient. <laughs> like you, we laughed, of course. Who was this guy and what was he about? Somebody's grandfather? A man in his second childhood? Mm -hmm. Just an old man who loves flashy cars and doesn't want to be long honked at? <laughs> or maybe he's a retiree who has who had never learned to drive. My Uncle George was one of those. The facts of what we saw were clear, but they obviously were not the whole story. So their meaning depended on what we brought to the equation. What perceptions and or biases affected our interpretation? What a wonderful thing the ability to imagine is, but 
We need to be careful. It can have a positive effect, but it can also be benign and it can be negative. It depends on how much of the story we know and what we bring to it. Hmm. This is why proofreading the Bible is dangerous. We don't know the whole story. And proofreading may produce an interpretation reflecting our bias, one we may not even know we have. Hmm. One of my teachers in seminary he taught counseling had a plaque on his desk that simply said, an uncalled for interpretation is a hostile act. Ooh. That's a lot to think about. Paul's message in Romans was pretty clear. Abandon your me first style of life, that's inward focus, and adopt a way reflecting love and compassion for one another, the outward focus. What a field day the Romans who were a diverse population of tradition, some Jews, some Greeks, some whatever. I mean, they were very diverse. What a field day they must have had interpreting that. Bury the past, says Paul. Get on with the future. Hmm. God's way. Don't let selfishness have a vote in defining who you are and what you're about. That's a tough, challenging message spoken to Romans and through them to us. Hmm. How will we interpret it? With what bias? Are we going on to perfection? Yes. When I was a little boy, I learned about fear of the unknown in part thanks to my grandfather, who was a big, burly steamship, steam engine, I'm sorry, mechanic. He worked on the railroad. It was a tough job, and he was a tough man. He didn't have much humor, or so I thought. When I was about three years old, Grandpa took me and my sister to visit an engine he was working on. It was in the Roundhouse in Wichita, Kansas. If you don't know what a Roundhouse is, ask me later. It was with other engines. It, along with some of the others, was fired up with a full head of steam, clanking in belching smoke, Grandpa invited us to go into the cab of the engine he was working on to see the controls. He said it'd be okay because he could make the engine do whatever he wanted it to. I wasn't so sure. I was three and I was terrified of this monster I stood beside. I knew only enough to be frightened, not enough to understand. Later, Grandpa developed throat cancer and had an operation that removed his voice and made him breathe through a hole in his throat. I didn't understand as I watched him decline over the next few years to become a shell of the man he had been. My experience with my grandfather taught me fear of what I didn't understand. But a few months ago, we found a letter Grandfather had written to my grandmother, which, while all this was going on, there was no fear in his letter, only positive news and tender love. My whole family were church-going Christians. Maybe Grandpa understood that he was sheltered in the arms of God. Now, fear is a powerful thing, but the love of God is more powerful. To know that is to know that we are not our own. And as Paul says, we live in the freedom of God. There's a hymn said to have been written by Donnie Rambo that catches some of the spirit. <clears throat> the things that I love and hold dear to my heart are just borrowed. They're not mine at all. Jesus only let me use them to brighten my life. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Fear of what? Okay, we 
we sometimes are fearful because concern for self doesn't permit us to trust God enough. Maybe we need to let go and let God be God. He has shown us what His love can do. There are other wonders to be encountered along life's way. <clears throat> He tells of having to explode a DDT bomb 
and the apartment to rid it of cockroaches and other vermin before he could even move in. Stringfellow was a social activist, sometimes critical of theological education. He became a lay theologian among whose credits were a seminar at Yale University Divinity School. A person of deeply held faith, he was also a critic of the modern church. Some of his writings are contained, contained in a book entitled A Keeper of the Word. Stringfellow felt that modern Christians placed too much emphasis on Easter. Not enough on Good Friday. The great love of God for humanity was better expressed, he felt, by the willing sacrifice of his own son. Oh, the empty cross, grace, and victory don't demean that they are celebrated on Easter, sure. But for the love of God, Springfellow chose Good Friday. A semantic difference? Perhaps. But that's why you see the crucifix alongside the empty cross in the chancel this morning. Good Friday and Easter are a package deal. And the fact that our crucifix comes from a poor African community in the Congo tells another part of the story we won't go into today. So how do you interpret all this? Are you open? Or do you have a bias? There's a common notion among some Christians that the book of James is out of tune with the rest of the New Testament, that his statement that faith without works is dead is simply wrong. Salvation by faith alone, right? Well, that's one interpretation, but a better one would be that faith and works or a package deal. Commenting on James, Bertrand Melbourne states that being a Christian is experiencing the love of God, allowing it to become a way of life, letting it affect change in your life, and having done so, reaching out to bestow it on another. How do we interpret that last part? Any reservations? Remember the assertion that salvation is by faith alone. In a few moments we will sing the hymn. There's a bomb in Gilead. And Jesus is the bomb from Gilead. But we can be part of it too. We don't have to be Mother Teresa. <laughs> we can be like Father Damien, Damien of Molokai who by all accounts won the very nice guy, <laughs> but gave his life to minister to lepers. We may not even know when it happens for us, becoming a balm of God to another. Bess and I sometimes give small amounts of money to homeless people on the street corners. Don't interpret that too much. Re recently, a homeless man came over to our car. He didn't ask for money. He said, would you folks pray for me? I'm having a bad day. Well, we, we know his name and we are praying. The life of discipleship won't beat our doors down. We have to look for it. We ought not sit and wait, but respond to the persistent call of Jesus like that in his words to Peter at the end of the Gospel of John. If you love me, if you love me, feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. What is love without action? <clears throat> and who are the sheep? I think we know. Discipleship doesn't always have to be doing great things. As Bishop Phillips used to say, wherever the arc of your talent, great or small, 
intersects the arc of the world's need. That's your calling. Edith Gibson put it this way, I wanted to work for the Master, I asked him for great things to do. He said, have you looked right around you? The little things need doing too. The key is to look, always be looking for new opportunities to make a difference. George Beverly Shea wrote a hymn, the words of which summarize the orientation of my thoughts for today. There's the wonder of sunset at evening. The wonder is sunrise I see. But the wonder of wonders that fills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. There's the wonder of springtime and harvest. The sky stars, the sun. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that's just begun. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our last hymn.